good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to, um, uh, to, to give this lecture about autosecond spectroscopy. Uh, so, um, of course, the topic is very broad, as you can imagine. So I will try uh, to, to guide you a little bit in the topic and uh, to give you a few examples on uh, uh, how we can use uh, up to second tools that you uh, have seen in the in the previous uh, lectures to uh, investigate uh, uh, physical phenomena. So uh, first of all, I would like to start with uh, um, giving you a motivation for uh, using uh, uh, up to second pulses to explore uh, matter in general and even uh, complex uh, systems. So. Um, I would say that in general, uh, one uh, um, uh, has the feeling that with these ultra short um, pulses, indeed, we can follow ultra fast dynamics, and we will see that in the in, the, in a few slides. Uh, and more specifically, after second pulses, indeed, provide uh, the time resolution to follow the uh, electron dynamics in in matter. Uh, but here I would like to more uh, to give you a more specific example on how the activated electron dynamics indeed can affect uh, the uh, functionality of even a complex system such as uh, DNA. So uh, you uh, may know that uh, when uh, uh, you, uh, DNA is exposed to uh, UV light, then it uh, may get damaged, and this is because one of, uh, so to say, uh, the um, structural uh, changes induced by the absorption of a UV photon um, can lead to uh, um, time and time impairing, uh, which is uh, represented in this picture here. And this is actually causing an interruption of the DNA uh, sequence. So this is the damage which can uh, lead basically to mutation and therefore uh, also cancer in our skins, for instance. Um, so life on Earth is any way possible, even if exposed to, uh, to UV light. And this is because we have also photoreactivation mechanisms. Uh, there is a DNA a photoreactivation process, uh, which is um, uh, done by uh, an enzyme. Uh, and this enzyme is schematically represented here. Uh, what happens here, again, is that light is activating this photoreactivation uh, mechanism. And uh, more specifically, a photon is absorbed by the HDF uh, uh, antenna protein. Uh, this uh, in the first step leads to an ultrafast electronic rearrangement, which is resulting on uh, uh, with a charge transfer to the FADH charge donor complex, which is transferring the charge to the thymine thymine pairing. And this transfer of charge leads to the uh, breakage of the thymine thymine bond. So you can see here that there is a chain of ultrafast events that I have described, which leads finally to the breakage of this um, bond and therefore to the reparation or reactivation of, of the DNA. Uh, and in this chain of events, you can see that everything is starting with an ultrafast electronic rearrangement, uh, which is then leading to subsequent steps such as energy and charge transfer, which leads to the final biological functionality, in this case, the DNA photoreactivation. This is a very nice example that I think I often start with uh, because it gives you already an impression that indeed ultra fast uh, or extremely fast processes such as uh, an electronic rearrangement can uh, be responsible indeed for uh, a more complex uh, functionality because they, uh, they are the first uh, phenomena activated by light and they basically stay at the bottom of this ultra fast chain of events. So it's very interesting to uh, get access to this uh, time scale and see if by controlling ultimately these electronic processes, one could even get new functionalities emerging in the system. So how can we access uh, these ultra-fast dynamics? Uh, many of you already uh, know that uh, the way 
uh, we can access uh, ultra-fast processes is indeed to have light pulses with um, a time duration which is in the order or less than the duration of the physical process we want to investigate. The way we do that is uh, with a typical time-resolved approach in which we have a first uh, uh, laser pulse called a pump, which is inducing the dynamics in the sample. And then we, we send a, a probe pulse, another uh, short light pulse, uh, which is properly delayed with respect to the pump pulse. And then we can detect the different observables. We will see that that's applied also to other second science as well. So this is the typical scheme that has been developed at first in uh, uh, in the femtosecond domain with uh, using uh, femtosecond lasers, but it has been applied, of course, to the uh, attosecond spectroscopy as well. So as I said, we need uh, the light pulse with the duration which is in the order of the physical process, of the duration of the physical process we want to get access to. So um, the, the question is how fast can we measure and how fast are the processes we can get access with our light pulses. So uh, basically uh, with the development of ultra fast uh, light sources, we also overviewed some of the advanced light sources available nowadays. Um, it has been possible to access faster and faster processes in, in, in matter and uh, more specifically with the advent of the femtosecond technology it has been possible to access all the structural dynamics in matter uh, while the real breakthrough has been the um, introduction or the birth of the second technology to access, uh, as I said, the uh, electron dynamics in, in matter, because indeed that, that is the typical electron time scale. So the way uh, we generate such short uh, light transients, you have seen already, I want to recall briefly the process just because it's of use also for explaining some of the after second spectroscopy techniques, is the high order harmonic generation process. So here we have uh, an intense laser focused on a target and you have seen that it's basically the process is based on a three-step model in which the intensity of the laser is sufficiently in eye, eye to, um, to uh, tunnel ionize an electron. The electron is then uh, accelerated in the external laser field and then it is driven back to the parent ion and recombining by emitting uh, an XUV or soft X uh, photon, I mean, a high energy photon. So this process is actually repeating every half cycle of your uh, driving field. And this is basically resulting on uh, a train of after second pulses. So uh, even if you use a quite a short uh, uh, driving laser, uh, you will uh, end up with a few recollision events. So a few after second pulses, which are separated of half of the periodicity of your laser field. That is a description in the time domain, which automatically results in the frequency domain with the frequency comb of odd order harmonics of the fundamental laser frequency. So this is an example of the harmonic spectrum that you get uh, with the separation corresponding to, uh, to omega zero, where omega zero is the fundamental frequency of your laser. So uh, in order to push with the time resolution, so I was telling you before that you need uh, pulses with a duration which is uh, compatible or should to say uh, even shorter compared to the physical uh, process that you want to observe, then one may want to push uh, the this time resolution by confining the harmonic generation process in a single event, so to say to isolate a single of second pulse. And for doing that, there are several techniques uh, and that uh, allows you to gate the iodine harmonic generation process to uh, a single pulse. And uh, ideally, you can see here is like canceling the harmonic generation process for every half cycle except for one. And uh, if you are able to do this, then this results in a, a continuous emission because, of course, in the frequency domain, this would correspond to a, a continuous emission. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, that is also broadband because uh, uh, if you want a very short pulse, this inevitably leads uh, to a very broad emission uh, that 
also affects a little bit uh, the capabilities you have in terms of spectroscopy that we will see very soon. Um, but that's the way we can achieve the shortest uh, pulses available in the world and uh, indeed uh, using a specific um, wavelength for generating uh, this radiation and uh, specific gating technique. Uh, it has been possible to generate 40 three attoseconds. So that's uh, so far the record in the in the duration of the attosecond pulse. It is you have seen already, uh, but what I would like now to uh, move your attention to is this are the spectroscopy methods. So the way uh, we can use uh, attosecond pulses or attosecond pulse trains to um, address uh, specifically uh, specific uh, dynamics in in med. So I would like to group the approaches that are actually used uh, for um, uh, for um, for in, in after second spectroscopy in two categories. Uh, the first category I uh, called it in situ approach. And the idea here is that actually uh, the ex uh, experimental implementation of this after second uh, spectroscopy technique is pretty simple and it relies on the I order harmonic generation process itself. So we can use the I order harmonic generation process as a time resolved method with after second res resolution to uh, investigate uh, matter. So here the setup is pretty simple because you just focus your intense laser on your target. Here I'm just showing a gas cell, but of course could be uh, very different targets. Uh, and then you filter out your uh, IR radiation and you just uh, uh, get your XUV. Uh, here I'm just showing a single auto second pulse, but I, you can have a train of auto second pulses, then you have it a gray, a gray team, and then you detect your harmonic spectrum here. So the setup is the simplest you can see. And uh, this method relies on the idea that um, the IR harmonic generation process uh, is uh, doing both the pump and the probing step that I was uh, describing before. Um, the dynamics is indeed uh, activated uh, by the strong field in the ionization step. And then it's probed by the recollision of the photoelectron wave packet with the uh, parent um, um, ion. Uh, and uh, the emission of the XUV radiations, to say, of the harmonic spectrum uh, is encoding information on these uh, dynamics, which has occurred between the ionization and the recombination step. Uh, so uh, the HG spectrum indeed. Uh, contains valuable information on the dynamics of the target, and this has been demonstrated by several groups. Um, as I said, the observable is uh, the HHG spectrum. Here you can use a combination of uh, uh, two colors for the amount generation, and there you can obtain even more information. So there are several uh, implementation of, of this technique. And here you can find a couple of references, uh, uh, very nice works. The first work, which indicated this as a path for the investigation of the molecular dynamics. Uh, another uh, very nice work showing that uh, indeed uh, the, um, uh, you can investigate, for instance, uh, uh, tunnel ionization uh, and see uh, if there is indeed a time or not for tunnel ionization. And I want also to mention that um, iodermic generation is one of the possible observables. Of course, the electronic wave packet will also scatter with uh, the, the parent uh, molecule and give you a signal with, which is called uh, laser-induced electron diffraction. And this is an alternative method to obtain information on these ultra-fast dynamics. And here I'm, I'm, I'm citing a, a, a work for instance, that you can have a look to, to see how it's possible to observe these dynamics via this laser-induced electron diffraction technique. So here you have auto second time resolution intrinsically in a sense because uh, the recombination is happening in a, a half a cycle of your driving laser and therefore this automatically gives you um, a, a fast uh, observable. The second uh, category uh, 
it's uh, the so-called uh, ex situ approaches. So here is a little bit more complicated because um, I, uh, as I show here as an example of the experimental implementation of this ex situ approach, one needs to uh, split the beam in two. So you have your uh, IR uh, driving field uh, generating the attosecond uh, pulse or the attosecond pulse trains in your uh, gas cell. And then again, you isolate your uh, XUV emitted radiation with a filter. Uh, but in this case, uh, you need to recombine your attosecond pulse with another uh, uh, light pulse. This is uh, similar to the more conventional pump probe approach that I was uh, showing or sketching before. So uh, ideally to achieve a full at the second time resolution here, um, the second pulse um, should be uh, an at the second uh, XUV or Soptix pulse. Uh, that's uh, something that uh, has been implemented by uh, a few group, uh, few groups now, but it's not so common because the uh, iodermic generation process uh, is an extremely nonlinear process resulting in a uh, reduced conversion efficiency. And therefore, typically the photon flux of the XUV emitted uh, radiation is uh, relatively low. And uh, it's difficult to uh, use this uh, uh, radiation in uh, uh, pump and probe fashion because you will have a very reduced number of photons and therefore the peak intensity that you can induce in the target is also relatively low. Therefore, the, more, uh, the most typical approach is to use a part of the uh, IR drive field to be recombined with your XUV radiation in a um, XUV pump IR or visible, uh, depending on the carrier wavelength of your uh, driving field um, uh, approach. And uh, of course, you can uh, tune the delay between these two passes with a second time resolution. And uh, um, what you will do then is uh, that you will focus those pulses on your target. So uh, please notice that the difference between the in situ approach that I was presenting before, where the sample was located here in the iod harmonic generation step, now the sample is located here. So I will focus my auto second pulse together with my IR pro pulse on the target again. As before, the target would be a gas, a liquid, a solid. I mean, there are many different kinds of targets that I can use. And here, the um, point is that I need to get an observable to track as a function of the delay between the uh, XUV and the uh, near the infrared uh, pulse. And uh, there are different observables indeed that I can uh, have. So uh, one is that I can, uh, for instance, measure the uh, transmitted XUV uh, spectrum uh, as a function of the delay between the pump and the probe pulses. And this is uh, the uh, transient absorption uh, technique that uh, I think will be presented uh, in, the, in the next lecture. Or for instance, you um, since the XUV, so the extreme ultraviolet uh, light will induce ionization of your target, you will produce photofragments. Then you can detect those photofragments. For instance, you can detect photoelectrons in a sense that you can detect the kinetic energy of those electrons, the angular momentum distribution, and same you can do for uh, the ions that you can detect, for instance, uh, the mass, the kinetic energy, and the angular momentum distribution. So um, there are these different observables. I, As I said, I will not in the following focus on the uh, transient absorption technique that you will have in the next lecture, but I will more specifically focus on the uh, detection of charged particles as an observable for this uh, at the second time result uh, methods. So I will try to provide two main examples where of physical processes uh, that uh, only at the second technology can address. Uh, the first example is uh, photoemission delays. So um, attosecond technology can be used indeed to uh, measure the time is required for an electron to be photoemitted. And this uh, encodes very important physical information. The second example I will give you uh, is uh, an, ex uh, an example of a physical process which has been of large interest in the last 
uh, decades, I would say, in the autosecond community. And this is the charge migration mechanism occurring in uh, uh, suddenly photoionized uh, molecules, which could be also relatively large uh, molecules. So let's start from the photoemission delays. So um, I entitled this as the autosecond chronoscopy of photoemission. So before autosecond technology has been available, available there has been um, a strong debate about uh, how fast an electron is photoionized. Is uh, photoionization instantaneous or not? So um, the, this basically um, can be uh, the physical process that's happening during photonization can be schematically uh, seen here in this in this figure. Um, what's happening is, is indeed that when the electron wave packet is photoionized, this um, results in uh, um, in a uh, um, so to say on the on, on a scattering uh, process on the outgoing electronic wave packet. Uh, this uh, outgoing electronic wave packet will indeed interact uh, with, um, with the potential, with the Columbic potential. It will be scattered by this uh, Columbic potential and this will result in a phase uh, induced on your electron wave packet. Here you see this is a sketch, basically a wave packet which is uh, just propagating in time without scattering versus an electron wave packet, which is indeed scattering with a Columbic potential. What's happening is that uh, this uh, wave packet, which is scattered as a residual phase, this uh, blue line here, uh, which is um, of course uh, resulting in terms of, uh, uh, in, in, a, in the time domain, in a delay. And this is called the Wigner delay which is basically the derivative of the phase with respect to the energy. So um, this is actually um, a full quantum mechanical uh, process, as I said, due to the scattering of the electronic, outgoing electronic wave packet on the Columbic potential. So the way we could, for instance, measure this uh, delay is, uh, because this delay is expected to be extremely fast in the order of, uh, uh, um, for instance, a few tens or a few hundred seconds, then we need the attosecond technology that has been one of the fundamental tools to get access directly to this uh, delay in photomission. Um, the way we can uh, measure this delay is, for instance, to send, as, again, a sequence, as I was uh, mentioning before, in this uh, XC2 approach, a sequence of uh, XUV plus IR pulses at variable delays, photoionize my target and measure the electronic, the photoelectron, uh, the emitted photoelectrons. I can measure, as I said, the kinetic energy uh, distribution, the momentum, the angular momentum distribution. We can measure this also in uh, coincidence with the emitted ion and so on. So there are various uh, methods. Uh, I can also exploit two different techniques that I will, I will shortly uh, explain to you. So one is the use of attosecond uh, an attosecond pulse train in combination with a relatively weak IR uh, pulse. And this is uh, the rabbit technique that you sh should have seen already for the characterization of uh, the attosecond pulse train. The second method relies on the use of an isolated attosecond pulse in combination with a relatively strong IR pulse. Uh, and in this case, uh, we uh, obtain um, uh, the, the so-called uh, street camera approach that it's also used for the characterization of isolated up to second pulses, but it's also a valuable spectroscopic tools. And as I will explain in a few slides. So let's start from uh, the rabbit technique. So reconstruction of attosecond beating by interference of two photon transitions. This is a method which has been introduced for the characterization of uh, attosecond pulse trains. What's happening here is that when you photoionize your target with your harmonic uh, spectrum, so you remember that you have the odd order harmonics of the fundamental, uh, then you will access, uh, as you see here, these uh, energy levels in the continuum. This is uh, with the uh, harmonic comp. But in the presence of a weak IR field, then I could add for instance, to this 
um, level here one more photon, I can absorb one more IR photon, or I could have this harmonic with uh, a transition uh, down to uh, the same energy level, um, again, with the difference of one IR photon. So this actually results in two different paths which can interfere because the, 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 photo, the emitted photoelectron will have the same energy. And this is resulting in this uh, sideband here. If you scan the delay between uh, the uh, XUV and the IR pulse, then you will have this typical oscillatory dynamics of the sidebands. This is because it's like an interferometer. And uh, you know that from interferometric uh, measurements, you can always get phase information. And this uh, phase information is essential uh, to get, um, as I said, also important, uh, an important indication about the photoemission delays. We will see that now. Indeed, the sideband oscillations can be uh, schematically represented as a cosinusoidal function of uh, um, these, uh, these terms here. And uh, here, the most important terms that I would like to highlight are um, this phase term, which is uh, actually related to the so-called chirp, so the intrinsic chirp that, the, uh, that your XUV second pulse has. And indeed, the method can be used to extract the phase of uh, the second pulses. But the the, 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 say the term I would like to focus uh, in in this lecture is the target scattering phase here that I'm now calling uh, uh, delta phi atomic in the case of an atom, but of course this could be any kind of, of target. And uh, this uh, phase, uh, as we have seen, corresponds indeed to a delay, which is uh, uh, so to say, this uh, tau atomic, as I call it now, a sum of two terms. The first term is the Wigner delay that we have discussed, the delay that is accumulated by the electronic wave packet by scattering on the, uh, on the Columbic potential. And then there is an additional term, uh, which is called the um, Coulomb laser coupling term. And it's basically only an IR-induced delay. You remember that you have a continuum-continuum transition, and this is actually resulting also on a phase term, which is uh, uh, translated automatically in a, in a delay. But this is only measurement-induced, so it's actually something that can be calculated, or at least for some targets, and can be subtracted to the total delay you extract from your rapid trace. And therefore, you can then measure this uh, Wigner delay that we were discussing. This was a very powerful, it has been, uh, and it's still a very powerful method to uh, extract uh, delays in photo emission. I give you here some examples from literature, but there are really a lot. And uh, it's actually, uh, for instance, it has been used in, in molecules to extract this Wigner delay. And in this case, it has been demonstrated, for instance, that there is even an angular dependence on, on the Wigner delays. And this you, you can extract it if you measure, for instance, uh, the angular momentum distribution of uh, your photoelectrons. Um, it has been also applied not only to the gas phase, so to atoms and molecules, but also in, in liquids and recently uh, there has been a work performed in water uh, demonstrating also that in this case a photoemission delay can be extracted as well. And uh, there are also measurements performed in, in solids and more specifically from uh, solid surfaces. Here uh, it's measurement uh, done in, uh, uh, in gold, in, uh, in silver, and uh, you can see um, that, I mean, here I'm mentioning uh, transport mechanisms, and we will see later also that actually delays are often um, uh, resulting not only because of this scattering, as I said, of the uh, electronic uh, wave function with the Columbic potential, which is just to say um, uh, the, the first step, of course, uh, of uh, inducing a delay, but there are more complex phenomena happening in the, in the extended materials, such as also transport that we have considered to consider, and it results as well as in, in a delay in photo emission. 
Okay, now I will move to the uh, quickly to the uh, second uh, method, which is the streaking technique. Here I'm showing what's happening to the emitted electronic wave packet uh, in the presence of a relatively strong IR field. Uh, as a relatively strong, I mean that the IR field need to reach an intensity of about uh, 10 to the 11 watts over a square centimeter. And you can see that basically the emitted uh, photoelectron wave packet, which is represented here by this uh, Gaussian, uh, green Gaussian going up and down, uh, the kinetic energy of these um, electrons is indeed by modulated by the presence of this external IR field. Uh, this is um, actually resulting, as you can see here, in this uh, streaking trace. So this is the photoelectron energy as a function of time. Um, you can see that the electron uh, emitted in the continuum uh, uh, is uh, gaining um, additional momentum via this external laser field. Uh, and basically the modulation of the kinetic energy is following the vector potential of uh, your driving laser. So this is a nice uh, method to obtain a 2D spectrogram, which is uh, electron, uh, sorry, uh, energy versus time. This 2D spectrogram very much resemble the um, uh, frog uh, spectrograms that are used also in optical uh, spectroscopy to retrieve uh, the characteristics, the temporal characteristics of the laser pulse. And indeed, this method has also been uh, named as frog grab uh, or frequency resolved optical gating um, for the complete reconstruction of atosecond second bursts. Uh, because indeed, from this 2D trace, you can uh, extract uh, both the characteristics of your driving laser and uh, the uh, Characteristic, temporal characteristics of your uh, attosecond laser pulse. So here we are not very much interested in the reconstruction of uh, the attosecond pulses, but in the extraction of information about photoemission delays. And again, uh, this is something that you can retrieve from such an approach because uh, if you can imagine that uh, you, um, you have um, at a certain delay the emission of uh, an electron, uh, starting with your um, uh, ionization event uh, with your XUV pulse, this would result in a certain uh, kinetic energy. Then you scan the delay between the two pulses and you get this uh, nice trace that we have seen. However, if the electron is emitted with a certain delay with respect to time zero, where the ionization event is occurring, uh, then um, this will result in a shifted streaking trace. And therefore, uh, one could try or attempt to measure this shift and uh, extract uh, the uh, photoemission delay. Again, uh, the shift in the streaking trace, so the measure time delay, contains two main factors in general. Uh, there may be additional factors, but uh, these are the two main factors that we have to take into account. One, again, is the Wigner delay. And again, we have this artificial or measurement-induced delay. Uh, the um, Coulomb laser coupling, um, which is due to the uh, interaction, long range, in long range interaction of your streaking field with the uh, asymptotic tail of the Coulombic potential. Um, again, this is the delay induced by the presence of the IR field, and we have to take it into account. So this is also uh, something that uh, has been used extensively as a method to extract, again, photoemission delays, uh, both from simple targets, like, for instance, here you can see the delay from the 2p and 2s orbitals of neon, or also more complex targets. For instance, here, again, delays extracted from the surface of tungsten. Uh, here is an example I want to show you in the case um, of uh, silica nanoparticles. This is a measurement we have uh, performed in my group in collaboration with the group of Matthias Kling a few years ago. Uh, here you can see basically an injection of uh, silica nanoparticles with a diameter of 50 nanometers in the, uh, in the velocity map imaging uh, spectrometer, which allows you to detect the angular momentum distribution of, of your um, photoelectrons. So here you can see the photoelectrons acquired, uh, for instance, um, in the case uh, of a target gas, uh, neon, uh, 
uh, or when a nanoparticle is it. Uh, there is a mixture in this uh, source of uh, nanoparticles and, and gas, uh, which is used for the injection of these nanoparticles in the gas phase uh, with this aerosol source. When you eat the gas, you have a, a basically a symmetric distribution of the photoelectric, an angular distribution, which is a symmetric. When you eat the nanoparticle, then you can recognize it because this becomes immediately asymmetric due to the, um, to the extended size of the nanoparticles and, the, uh, and then the sensitivity you have on the direction of the impinging light on the nanoparticle. So you can measure this photo uh, angular distribution as a function of the delay between the XUV and the IR propass, extracted the streaking trace, as I was showing you before. And then you can immediately see that the streaking trace of the gas with respect to the nanoparticles is indeed delayed. And uh, by uh, doing a uh, modeling, uh, this is actually um, quite um, sophisticated methods, but it's mostly based on uh, uh, semi-classical model, including uh, a classical uh, propagation via the Monte Carlo um, calculation. And uh, what you can see actually is that the theory, which is actually the line here, the blue line and the red line is reproducing quite well what we get with the experiment. The blue is the delay measured in neon, the red is the delay measured in the case of nanoparticles. As you can see, there is a shift uh, between the two traces of about 100 attoseconds. Both, they have a certain um, uh, uh, trend, and this is actually representing simply the auto chirp, which is also resulting uh, as a delay, but they are shifted of about 100 auto seconds, and this is actually what we measure as the escape time for, or the time that for the electron takes to go out of the nanoparticle. In this case, it's an extended system, so you have to mention that the electron has to scatter uh, along the way before going out of the nanoparticles, and indeed, from the escape time via the theory, we have been able to extract an inelastic scattering time for this uh, electron of about 300 attoseconds. So this is also another uh, um, observable, you can, oh, sorry, another quantity that you can measure, not only the Wigner delay, which in, in this particular case has been neglected, but also, uh, uh, the, as I was saying, the delay which is induced by the transport, which is resulting uh, in, uh, in the case of the classical transport in uh, elastic and inelastic scattering times. And in this specific case, we even got an information about the inelastic scattering time of uh, inside the silica nanoparticle. Okay, the other example I want to provide is about uh, at streaking spectroscopy in, in C60. Uh, C60 is actually quite a big molecule, uh, it's this uh, buckyball um, structure, uh, which is, has been of interest because of the presence of, uh, for many aspects, but uh, also because of a possible collective um, excitation that can be done uh, around the 20 EV, resulting in a very broad uh, resonance. A broad resonance corresponds to a fast process, as you may imagine. So. Um, the presence of uh, resonance is also inducing uh, a photoemission delay. And uh, this is because the outgoing electron wave packet will not only uh, scatter with the Columbic potential, but also with the potential shape induced by the resonance. And in this case, the, uh, the, the, the screening or anti-screening effect induced by this resonance should result in a strong advancement or retardation of the electronic wave packet. And therefore, you expect to have a strong change in sign of the Wigner delay across the plasmonic resonance. We have done this measurement in C60 again with the same approach I was describing before with the velocity map imaging and measuring the streaking trace. And we have compared once more uh, the C60 with neon. Uh, again, uh, what you can extract is a delay from the streaking, st from the streaking trace, which is a result of uh, several terms. In this case, there is um, a differential measurement done between C60 and neon, so you can sub subtract from the delay of C60 the delay measured for, for neon. And if you do so, then you can cancel, for instance, the laser coulomb coupling um, term, because it's expected to be very similar for C60 and neon. 
And then you end up with these three terms, the Wigner delay for neon is known, and therefore you can extract the Wigner delay for C60 and uh, also the IR induced dipole effect for C60. This is what we, uh, we have obtained. The green line is the experimental results, which is indeed changing sign across the plasmonic resonance. The red line is the calculation, including the Wigner delay and induced by the resonance and the IR induced dipole. And um, although there is an overestimation, a little bit of, of the delays, the general trend is uh, quite similar and reproduced by the theory. Okay, now I will quickly move to the second topic, which I briefly overviewed. This is actually the charge migration mechanism. So sudden ionization of a molecule typically results in a creation of a hole. And uh, this hole, um, most of the time, is not stationary hole. And more specifically, um, if you create a superposition of electronic states, this superposition can be done uh, we will see that either by um, ionization with a broadband pulse, which is, of course, ionizing several states, or by ionizing a correlated electronic state, then uh, you, you create this non-stationary stationary, uh, condition for which the charge, uh, the ionic charge, or, or well, this is actually uh, the whole, uh, will start um, uh, migrating uh, from one side to another of the molecular backbone. So either you see that as holes or electrons moving, but basically this is a very fast process occurring from a few hundred attoseconds up to a few femtoseconds. Uh, this was a preliminary calculation done by the group of Sederbaum, which was triggering the interest on this physical process, because after second technology is, so to say, the ideal tool to address these uh, fast dynamics. So the way we um, tried to measure this uh, fast mechanism was, in this case, to um, ionize a relatively large molecule such as an aromatic amino acid with a combination of XUV and IR passes. Again, it is the same approach as before, but in this case, we can measure ions instead of electrons. So more specifically, the mass of those ions as a function of the delay between these two pulses. If you measure this uh, mass spectrum for um, these two aromatic amino acids, phenylalanine and tryptophan, that you can see here, you can see that it's quite rich, the mass spectrum, because XUV photons are quite energetic, so producing several fragments. But something that we have identified to be of particularly interesting is the doubly charged ammonium ion for both molecules, which results from the loss of the carboxylic group. This ion is of particular interest because exhibits uh, fast oscillations. These are oscillations which we could not attribute to uh, nuclear dynamics because they are faster than any vibration. And uh, we assigned to indeed uh, coherent uh, beatings between um, uh, electronic states. Indeed, our XUV pulse is broadband enough, as I was mentioning before, to create a coherent superposition of electronic states. The IR problem pulse will double ionize the molecule and reveal those uh, beatings. The beatings we have uh, identified via theory are uh, basically inducing, in the case of phenylalanine, the main beating is uh, resulting in a charge migration from the carboxylic to uh, the amino group of the molecule MBAC in 0.25 petahertz. In the case of tryptophan, the main beating seems to be the superposition of two beatings. One corresponds to the migration from the amine to the carboxylic group in 0.27 petahertz, similar to the phenylalanine case and the other one from the amino to the indole group of the molecule in 0 0.23 uh, petards. This is uh, um, the interference between these two beatings is producing the 0 0.25 petards beating observed in the measurement. Uh, finally, as a last example, uh, we performed some experiments as well in, uh, in adenine. This is one of the fundamental building block, blocks of DNA. Here you can send, um, for instance, uh, the XUV light to ionize the molecule and see if uh, electronic processes are activated as well. So again, we measure the mass spectrum of uh, the molecule as a function of the delay between the two passes. So this is exactly the same measurement as I was showing you before. In this case, you can see that the large 
uh, fragments or the large uh, ions. They, at zero time delay, they basically show a strong reduction with a relatively increase of the small fragments. And this is because actually when you send your IR pulse on top of the XUV pulse, you, uh, you will um, excite the molecule even more. So we'll have the more excited states of the ionic uh, molecule and therefore this will produce even a smaller fragments. The most interesting observation here is a uh, delayed um, uh, adenine dication signal. Uh, it's delayed of about uh, 2.28 uh, femtoseconds. Um, this is actually very interesting. So we can, by sending the IR propulse, we can indeed observe uh, the intact molecule adenine 2 plus, which otherwise we cannot observe with the XUV only but only if we send the IR pulse with a short delay with respect to the XUV pulse. This is a very short time delay. So it's certainly uh, um, related to an electronic reorganization as the example I was giving at the, as the very, very, very beginning of my uh, talk. And what's happening here is that after the XUV ionization, a hole is created in an inner valence. This is triggering a shake-up mechanism for which an electron is filling these vacancies and uh, promoting a second electron to the valence of the molecule, where the IR probe pulse can uh, then doubly ionize. This is a sort of stabilization path in a way because that via this double ionization, we can keep the molecule intact. But most uh, interestingly, we are able to track indeed the time it takes for this shake-up process to occur. This is a direct, so to say, uh, way of observing this via the formation of the delayed dication. Via the theory, we have been able also to see that during this shake-up process, which indeed takes a few femtoseconds to occur, uh, we, have, we can observe a charge inflation mechanism or charge migration towards the outside of the molecule. And we have seen that if we calculate the absorption of the IR probe pulse as a function of the time delay between the two pulses, we can see that indeed the absorption of the IR probe pulse that here is shown as a depletion of this lumoplastic state, this inner valley state, is the, uh, is uh, so the valley state that is populated uh, via the, uh, the shake-up process. Um, you can see that the depletion of this state is actually uh, starting uh, like two femtoseconds after zero time delay, because we can more efficiently absorb the near propulse only when the charge starts to inflate. So this charge migration mechanism which is correlation driven, driven by this shake-up process, is responsible for uh, an increased absorption of the IR probe pulse. So we can see that we can use a fundamental process, electronic mechanisms such as the shake-up process, to control the absorption of our IR probe pulse and therefore, uh, in this case, uh, control the photoproducts and more specifically create more adenine a molecule, stable molecule. So we called it sort of correlation driven stabilization process. And this is schematically represented here. So we ionize, we have the shakeup, which results in a charge inflation in a few femtoseconds, and this will increase the absorption of the IR profiles, creating the stable dicatide. Okay, I think more or less my time is, is over, but I want just to mention that it's possible also to combine other colors with the XUV, not only the IR, and more specifically, it's of very high interest to combine now the XUV pulses with uh, UV light pulses because UV is the light which is penetrating our atmosphere and it's triggering many of the photochemistry and ph photochemical and photobiological processes on Earth. So we recently have combined this UV radiation, which is um, which we have measured to be uh, around uh, 1.9 femtoseconds with XUV pulses, with now the aim of investigating similar processes, but now triggered by the UV pulse and probed with attosecond time resolution with the XUV pulse. So that is just an example of how uh, an attosecond laboratory where we measure this kind of processes looks like as you many of you know, and it's probably similar to many of your, of your labs. If you want to, to, to visit us and see what we do here, you can find our website. 
And then it's time for acknowledgement. So this is all the people uh, who were involved in several of the collaboration I was mentioning. And then of course, I would like to thank you for your attention and encourage you to ask all the questions you have about this lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>